All right, it's, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the uh, first speaker of the first uh, inaugural, inaugural uh, Tiny ML Summit, Professor Marianne Verhelst. Uh, she has a PhD from KU Leuven, where she is also an associate professor. Uh, her research focuses on embedded machine learning, hardware acceleration, self-adaptive circuits and systems, and low power embedded sensing and processing. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot. Well, good morning. I'm very happy to be able to be the first speaker here at this tiny ML summit. Uh, what I want to show you is how in my lab, a research lab at KU Leuven, really work towards enabling machine learning intelligence workloads in small devices. And of course, obviously not by letting them send all their data to the cloud, which we don't want for privacy, latency, energy reasons, but really by allowing them to at least do the inference pass and in the long run also some learning within the small device itself. And this obviously comes with lots of bottlenecks, energy bottlenecks, memory um, size bottlenecks, computational resource bottlenecks, and what I want to show you is how in my lab, we really strive for innovations both at the circuit level, at the architecture level, and at the algorithm level to come to the most optimal devices. And the key takeaway I want you to get from this presentation is that you can do innovations at each of these levels, but to be honest, at the level itself, that's not what counts. You really strive for the impact they have at the application and at the system level. That's what your user cares about. So your user wants to get a certain performance, whether this is a certain accuracy within a certain latency spec, and just get that at the minimal energy consumption possible. And that's where we should judge all the individual innovations we do. So I'm going to go through some things we did at the lab, showing that, and then also see how we try to connect all these levels. So let's start at the circuit level. And the circuit level people are often the ones that really are striving to get the largest amount of tera operations for what? That's the benchmarking number, it seems, if you look just at that level. Because at that level, we're really just trying to make an efficient multiply accumulate. Because in many machine learning workloads, and I'm going to focus mostly on deep neural networks, in many of these workloads, that's the key computational element that you can try to get done as efficient as possible. Now, you have many design choices here, and you probably today in the different talks, you see many ideas coming by. And also in my lab, we explored a couple of efficiency improvement techniques. On the one hand, all the way on the right, you can start to squeeze on the precision that your multiply accumulate unit computes at. And very early on in the lab, we started to build variable precision multiply accumulate blocks that can compute at 16-bit or 8-bit if they have to, but that can also scale down to 7 and 6 and 5 and 4, anyway down to 2 bits precision if you want to. All the way on the other end of the spectrum, there are people working more in the analog domain, doing maybe only binary computations with as low power as possible with charge sharing and so on. But this is work from a student of Boris Merman here, with which we collaborated a lot because we also made a digital counterpart of that. I do still binary compute, but in the digital domain. You have many different options here. All of them we taped out in chips. And obviously, if you start to measure them in the lab, you will see that the analog binary mark is the most energy efficient you can get. Super high tera operations per watt seems great. If you care more about area and how much you can parallelize things, the digital binary mark started to be, turn out to be much smaller. On the other hand, they don't have lots of flexibility. You can only compute binary nets, which for many applications simply doesn't get you your top accuracy. So you're a bit stuck there and will not be able to map everything. So, okay, here we are at the circuit level. We see goods and bads, but if you would ask me which one should I put in my product, to be honest, if you just look at this level, there's no way you can figure it out. You cannot tell from looking at these things which is more optimal than another one. Because choices you make here have humongous impact on how much you can parallelize your processing elements, how much data fetches they have to do hence, how much data reuse there is, what the memory implications are, and so on. So you have to start to look at what the impact on the other levels is. So let's move up and go to the architecture level. At architecture level, the most important question is how do I move data from my memory to my processing element array? 
How do I distribute the data back and forth? And also there, there is many options being explored that we also looked at in our lab. On one hand, you have the more traditional type of processors where you start to have huge processing elements arrays, two or three dimensional arrays, but in a more of a Neumann type of style where you have some centralized memory or a couple of levels of memory hierarchy, and which are also very flexible. The other end of the spectrum are the near memory or in-memory compute blocks where memory and processing elements are much more distributed, um, close together, often giving you higher efficiency, both in terms of energy and area, allowing you again to parallelize more. But you have to be well aware that it's very difficult to make such more systolic or streaming accelerators work efficiently across a variety of workloads. For many different type of neural network kernels, you will have strong underutilization of your data paths, and you will have quite some efficiency losses because of that. Again, of course, it's a hard judgment call to pick one or the other here without looking at the whole stack. But even if you could, suppose we would say, okay, let's go for one of the two approaches. Doesn't matter which one. You're still stuck with many architectural questions. For example, if I give you a certain amount of silicon area for this, would you rather spend it on more processing elements or would you rather spend it on more memory? What's the best? If you put a bit more of one, you'll have a penalty to pay on the other. And if you say, okay, let's have so much memory, would you rather have global buffers, local buffers, a hierarchy of how many levels and so on? And again, choices you make here will have humongous impact on how your processing elements are interconnected, on how your algorithms can be folded and mapped and scheduled on your architecture. So in a way we can say which is better than the other. Okay, so here we are. It seems hardware designers are very uh, people to really be uh, feeling sad about because they have so many choices and there is no way to figure out what to do unless they go talk to their algorithmic people. You would think algorithm guys then have a great life because they can just make all the choices. But do they? Because also at the algorithmic level, you have many degrees of freedom. To just do one task, a certain functionality, machine learning task with a certain um, accuracy, you still have many options. You can play with the depth of your neural networks, the width of your neural networks, how many channels do I take, what's the topology of every layer I use, do I use feed forward and skip connections, and so on. And for each of the choices I make here, I use a certain number of input channels in every layer, I have a certain depth, I use this network topology, I will just get one solution, and if I train it well, I will get a certain dot in my accuracy, my error rate, versus my complexity, how many multiply accumulates do I have to do to get this network. I could as well have put the model size on the y-axis or the number of feature memory fetches and so on. So you get one dot here for one combination here. If I use different depths and different topologies and different widths, for exactly the same neural network task, I will get many dots on the graph. And you could say, okay, let's just go with the most optimal curve, which seems this Pareto optimal. Get the best accuracy for a certain complexity. But are these really, every dot here is now a different neural network topology. But are these really the most efficient neural network topologies? People like to think in terms of max or in terms of kilobytes of model memory, but nothing says that this thing is more efficient than this one because it will be folded differently on the underlying hardware architecture. There is more or less data reuse to be done there. It's still hard to say. And we even have taken one very important parameter into the game here yet, which is the precision at which you run these neural networks. You don't have to run at 16 bit or 8 bit even. You can go to 6 bits and 3 bits and whatever you want. So for each of the precisions you pick here, I will get a different Pareto curve in the plot I just showed. Uh, the red line is a 16-bit we just saw, but I have a line for 4-bit and 2-bit and binary neural networks. And now you see some interesting things. To reach a certain accuracy, unless you're really pushing for the highest ever, to reach a certain accuracy, I can choose to have a small 8-bit network, a medium-sized 4-bit network or 2-bit network, or a larger binary neural network. What's the best one? Would you rather have many binary ops or a few 8-bit ops? 
And it's not just about the cost of this operation in terms of Terra operations per watt or picojoule per operation. No, it goes much further than that. Architecturally, smaller op binary operations, I can put more of them. I will parallelize differently. I will have less memory fetches. It has many consequences at all of these different levels. So here we are. No one can make decisions here in isolation. If you want to have a good, efficient application, your system level to get a certain performance is as efficient as possible, you really have to think across all these levels. And that means that you have to bring hardware knowledge into account in other levels and really bring it up to this algorithmic level. To do that, of course, you need to build very good models of your hardware architecture and not just build a fixed model, but have a model that's parameterized along all the dimensions you still want to optimize in terms of how your PEs are parallelized, what memory hierarchy do you have. All the things you want to bring into the optimization games should be parameterized in the model you bring up to the higher levels. We did this for energy. You could also do it for a latency target and area target and so on. And if you do that, and this is still, these are graphs for C part 10, by the way, a small um, example. If you do that, you could take the graphs we just made and turn them into system level trade-offs. Now we are comparing things that the user cares about. You take at the system level, what accuracy do I get for a certain investment of energy of the whole system? Not just the chip, not just the data path, but the whole system, including external memory accesses, efficiencies, the whole system you want to take into account. And then you start to see the real optimal solutions, which here, and again, it's for CIFAR 10, it's not a general conclusion at all. In this case, it turns out that a four bit network was the most efficient choice with a certain parallelization that's under the hood. And every dot here again is a different neural network topology, depending on the accuracy you want to go for. Does this mean we should all build four bit processing elements? No, this is application and task dependent. So there is other cases where we see we need eight bits or six bits and so on. You can do the same trade off analysis to now figure out how many memory elements do I want? What's my optimal ratio between data pad and memory and so on. Now what you clearly see because it's very so much across applications is that there is a very strong need to flexible processors. Processors that can work at different resolution points, computational precision points. Processors that can play with the parallelism they exploit, with the memory hierarchy they have built in. And that's also what we try to design in different generations of chips in our lab. Combining them then with hardware models to really do a cross-layer optimization to at the same time figure out the best network topology, figure out the best hardware configuration and computational precision to run at, at circuit level. Now, all sounds nice in theory and academically professors can just recite what they want. Let's see what it brings at some practical applications. So I'm going to show you two examples rather quickly because of uh, lack of time, but we can discuss more later if you want. One is more in the image processing domain, the other is in acoustic processing domain. Now one important thing I have to mention up front is that we are stepping away here in these applications from optimizing one fixed task. You're going to see that we're going to start to build dynamic neural networks, which are behaving differently depending on what kind of data comes in. And each level of this dynamic network will go through an optimization cycle, as I just described. Let me make it very practical. Suppose you want to do a face recognition task. So I see many faces in the room, and I want to characterize which people I see out of a very large face database. Thousands of faces are in my database. You can build a neural network for that. You can optimize it, as I just said, with what precision do I want, what parallelism, what data path, and so on. But you'll see that to a huge phase database, your network is still going to be very large. Too large to run in always on mode. You simply cannot afford, not even with the best hardware we can build. But you don't have to run this always on. Recently, dynamic neural networks become very popular, which are networks where you first run a small subset of the network, then you have some decision nodes. In this case, we try to figure out, is there a face in the image? Only if there is a face, a decision node will pass the information to a next se section of the network. You still don't have to go to the big one. You could have a network that checks for the most common faces in the image. 
And if it's not a common face, another decision node can then only activate the big network. Now, these are now cascaded or staged or dynamic neural networks. And each of these levels, you can now start to optimize across the algorithm, architecture, and circuit level. Where again, you'll need flexible architectures or a combination of accelerators that are going to be optimal in the space of these networks from small or tiny to small to large to run the whole stack efficiently. So if we did that with the chips that we developed in our lab, we were able to achieve such a pipeline with less than one millimeter on average. This is only for 10 frames per second where the phase detection happens on small frames, but still you can really optimize across the stack. Switching gears to a second and last application is in the acoustic domains, acoustic domain where we want to do keyword spotting and uh, speaker recognition. So I don't want to know just, did someone say a keyword, but also is it one of my authorized owners that said the keyword? And again, we're going for dynamic machine learning models here, but it's no longer a stack of only neural networks. We're mixing it up here a bit. We're a first simple classifier with some decision trees on features is checking whether there is voice. Then we use a neural network, an LSTM to be precise, to check whether there is keywords in the speech. And only if there is a keyword, we fire up a GMM, a Gaussian mixture model, to check who is saying the keyword or whether it's one of the authorized speakers that is saying the keyword. And again, you can do the whole cross-layer optimization on each of these different levels. And random on, we here created a set yeah, okay, this will activate on a larger thing. And run them basically on a set of accelerators that we optimized for the different tasks. This was integrated in the lab um, in a single chip solution together with an analog front end. And you can then run the whole stack at about a 20 microwatt average power consumption. And again, this includes everything. It's except the microphone that's still off, but everything else is inside this number. All memory fetches you'll have to do, all processing until just these labels come out. Voila, so this brings me to the end. I hope I was able to show you that we can do innovations at all these levels, but that we should all collaborate in the rooms to connect the dots between the levels because the system counts and not just maximizing Terra Ops per Watt. Thank you. Ask whether there are questions or what's the goal? Any questions? Uh, yeah? Yeah? Yeah, let me go back. Hi, if you wait for the microphone for your question, then everybody can hear it. Thank you. Yeah, uh, go back one more slide. Yeah. So the one in the this one? The one in the middle says, first is if there is a face, then there is a owner detection. Why yeah. Is owner detection? Because you're finding out what, whose face is it at the end. Yeah. What's in the middle? No, this one just say yes, if there is a face or not. If not, it just stops. If there is a face, it checks for one, or you can have a, a set of, of most common people, maybe my family members and so on. And if it detects one of those here with enough certainty, it just stops. So this label goes out and is already a classification. Only if this one says, I'm not sure, he can push to the next level. I so this is, this is a decision block, but it's not if you stop here that nothing comes out. Then oh, you I can see. already I, have a classification. I, I got it. And one more question on the next slide. Yes. Uh, so, the, so actually, the neural network is only operating in the middle. Yeah, the we only use the neural network. The first one is the decision network. tree or some traditional stuff. This is and more the traditional. the last one is GMM. Yeah, correct. Yeah. We try to see the most optimal kind. If you put a neural network here, you can do it. Your accuracy is slightly better, but you pay a very large price and you're always on. Uh, we have a solution here, but it consumes more. But it's, uh, and then uh, running neural nets here, the GMM just work really nice and they're very efficient to implement. So that's why we stick to it. Yeah. Yes. So uh, you mentioned that we have to work across the levels. So I'm thinking from a soft, uh, training perspective, can we do something at a training level so that we are creating a model which is more, you can say, better fit for the hardware? There is a lot of work to be done at the training level because the biggest challenge to work across the models is obviously to be able to explore all possibilities you have here. And 
people start to work a lot on smart sampling strategies and so on, but still the biggest bottleneck to optimize this well is how often we have to go through this loop. So what we're working very hard on is to have very fast, but still pretty accurate models of these things at the lowest level, exposing all the degrees of freedom. But still, every time you would have to train a neural network at this level to judge how good the accuracy is. And that now is the biggest bottleneck, how often I have to train something here. So if you can indeed improve sampling strategies or find smart updates, trainings, where you can start from a, a topology that was slightly different and so on, there is lots of innovation still to be done. Yeah, I'm thinking something like if a dropout layer, you can have a, that's a precision loss layer. So, Sorry, that, I don't understand. so instead of a dropout layer, you can have a precision loss layer, yeah. and which makes sure that all the bits, uh, you can say, land randomly uh, noised. Yeah. And that makes the network will more robust to the precision loss. Yes, yes, also. Yeah, so indeed, for training for reduced precision, also there's a huge bunch of work being done, and that's also something I think we should keep on pushing in the coming months. Yeah. OK, one more question. Thanks so much for your presentation, very interesting. Um, uh, you didn't touch anything about uh, framework level uh, challenges, about developing uh, um, variable precision uh, neural networks. Is because it's obvious or do you see gaps? Or can you uh, no, comment? It's no, not, it's not obvious. So uh, we were in, yes, yes. exactly, <laughs> discussing this yesterday also with Peter. Um, so what we did in our lab is uh, we started developing this before whole TensorFlow Lite and the quantis functions and so on were there. So we kind of coded up our own quantization layers that we put in between things and for the gradient we needed straight two estimators and so on. So it worked, but I don't think it is the best way of doing it, but um, there is lots of efforts going on now and, and we need it. I mean, it's obvious that there is big gains. By doing a good quantization, we gain more than one, sometimes even two orders of magnitude in efficiency, so it's huge. Yeah. Um, and I was going to say, I don't know if Raziel is here from Google. I don't know if he's here yet. Um, but when he gets here, he's actually leading the quantization team on TensorFlow. Um, and we are putting a lot of work into this. Yeah. Um, and we're very keen to hear what you actually uh, need. So um, come and find me or Raziel. Um, and uh, tell us about what you need from the uh, framework side for quantization. It's a big deal. Yeah, it is. Thanks. Well, uh, we look to these guys. Well, thanks a lot for all the interest, and I look forward to discussing more. Well, uh, well.